Oh, there we go. Uh, morning, everybody. I'm Michael Boralski. I'm the head of regulatory services for U.S. Bank Global Fund Services. Uh, as the name suggests, we are a service provider to all types of pooled investment vehicles, uh, as well as a subsidiary of U.S. Bank, uh, the fifth largest commercial bank in the country. Uh, I have a great group of friends up here today, so I'm going to pretend that Ben leaked his keynote comments to us because we're going to expand on a number of the themes that, that he was talking about in his keynote address. Uh, and really the, the first one that we're going to jump into in, in just a moment is about the culture in the ETF community. Uh, ben mentioned that it's a very collaborative culture, and that's kind of the point here is I've got a, a great group of folks here to share with you their personal experience getting up and running in the ETF space. Because uh, I think that's one of the places that this industry has been particularly effective is in not reinventing the wheel, in sharing ideas, and in supporting other issuers, getting new products off the ground. You could still compete with them, but uh, we, we further things much faster when we're open about what we're doing and what those new ideas are and what some of the challenges are. So let me take a moment here first. I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce yourselves, uh, give a little bit of background on your firm, if you would. Sylvia? Hi, I'm Sylvia Jablonski. I'm the CEO and CIO of Defiance ETFs. So Defiance is just about above a billion in AUM, so we're kind of a, a smaller new entrant into the ETF space. We've been around for a few years, and we focus on essentially launching thematic ETF products and now enhanced income products. Good morning, everybody. My, my name is Lance McGray. Um, I head up the ETF product development team at Advisors Asset Management. Uh, AAM has been around since 1970, 78, 79 as a bond broker dealer. Over the years, our business model has really changed into more of a traditional asset management business um, where we uh, got into the SMA business in the, the early 2000s, got into the unit investment trust business where we're currently, I believe, the second largest UIT sponsor here in the U.S., then successfully launched the first few mutual funds, which are around $3 billion in assets. and. Uh, you know, go back seven years ago, it's my responsibility to bring us up to speed in the world of ETFs. Uh, so I've been at AAM for six or seven years now. Um, we have about $700 million in assets, um, but hopefully that grows much quicker in the coming years. And, uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mike Castino. I'm a partner with Sound Capital Solutions. And in a prior life, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Michael Poralski and other colleagues at US Bank and bringing product to market in that place. And, um, and now, looking forward to discussing these opportunities here. Um, one other thing, uh, I also have the privilege of serving on a 40 Act Trust, so a little bit of, I guess, insight and perspective on that, hopefully we can share today. Terrific, all right, we're gonna start with product. Uh, Sylvia, I'm gonna turn to you first, because what I think people wanna hear is how do you decide what product you're gonna bring to market? There's so many different opportunities out there. Can you share Defiance's story of what, what you decided to lead with and how that's evolved over time? Yeah, sure, so you know, we, we're sort of late to the game, but early to the game, because we know that ETFs are kind of growing, changing, and, and morphing. So when we came out, you know, we knew that we needed a product that could be sort of our, you know, our brand, something that, you know, people would, would look at and, and understand there's this new ETF company in town, they're here to stay, they're, they're not just, you know, kind of another wild idea that's gonna fall to the wayside, because I think as everybody knows, a lot of the ETF products that come out now essentially close um, because of, you know, market proliferation. But our first product was 5G. So around COVID, you know, everybody went home and people were essentially, you know, locked out of their offices, and all you heard on um, all you heard on TV was essentially connectivity, the need for um, the need for semiconductors, the need for new laptops, the need for technology, the need to you know connect organizations globally, and that's really what actually propelled our company and our fund forward. So. 5G was actually launched in 2018, a little bit before COVID. And at that time, you know, it was sort of the next gen communications ETF. And we marketed it, we had salespeople selling it, and it wasn't until, you know, that, you know, it, we heard it in the opening remark, right? It's a ticker game sometimes. We had the right ticker. The word 5G was, was being used in the media and the press every single day, and then that ETF took off. And from there, 
you know, we really thought of ourselves at that time as an ETF company that would expand on kind of the classic sector ETF. So if there was a classic technology ETF, what's the future of technology? And we thought, well, that must be AI, that must be machine learning, that must be quantum computing, supercomputing. And so then, you know, we launched quantum off of that. And it's the idea of, you know, what will technology's next super cycle be? So that was, you know, our next thought. Then we had an EV product and, you know, now, you know, so how do we think about this? We look at products that are very successful. We try to think about whether or not we could think of a new take on them to enhance them, to make them better, to make them more innovative, more interesting. And, you know, then we kind of go with it. You know, that being said, though, we've had some failures, too. We actually launched a SPAC ETF, the first SPAC ETF, when SPACs were incredibly popular. We raised about $100 million in three weeks in that ETF. And then six months later, it was almost down to zero and we had to close it. <laughs> so it doesn't always work in your favor. Um, but I think, you know, just trying to find holes in the market, trying to think about innovation, the, the trillions of dollars that are going to millennials and Gen Z, where they'll want to invest, and, you know, where could, where could we have some sticking ground with our products? So that's how we go about it. So, Lance, you've got a very different product lineup. You know, Sylvia's firm rode the, the thematic wave with just about every thematic idea that I think uh, clients were coming up with. Um, talk a little bit about AAM's approach and the, the products you led with. Yeah, it, it is quite different. Um, I remember about eight years ago before I decided to leave my last shop, um, which was a top 10 ETF issuer, um, and head over to AAM. And I was having a conversation with an old colleague of mine, a, a boss of mine in the past, and he's like, you guys need to jump on the thematic vein. This is, this is where the assets are going. This is where everybody's raising assets. And at the end of the day, I, I just, it's not a knock on the thematic plays because clearly ETF invest, investors really enjoy having access to themes and, and different trading vehicles and things of that nature. But it was really important for me to really stick to the, the DNA of advisors asset management, which is really income solutions, right? Leverage our distribution team, which consisted of 30 plus wholesalers with boots on the ground. Um, leverage our relationships on the street with liquidity providers and asset managers and distribution companies and really go after, you know, what had made AAM a $30 billion asset manager over the last 30 years. Um, so when I, when I came in from a product development standpoint, we had nothing. We had, we had no trust. We had no distribu ETF distribution. We had no lim limited marketing. Um, we had no product roadmap. And it was really challenging for us to navigate um, the product entry into the U.S. space because we had a lot of product. There are very few firms out there that have the product breadth that AAM has, and we really had to worry about cannibalization. How does an ETF, how would an ETF be treated um, on a platform, at a wire? Would they remove a unit investment trust because it was 20, 30, 50 basis points more? What would they do with a clone mutual fund? So it was really about playing to our strengths and try to um, launch products that we thought fit our DNA and would give our self the best chance to raise assets in the future. Um, unfortunately, as, as Sylvia said, things don't go as as planned. Um, we came out with a high dividend value lineup in 2018, 2017, 2018, in an environment where it was all growth. Interest rates were zero. There was nobody looking for value. There was nobody looking for dividends. There was nobody looking um, for deep value plays. And that really hurt us going into COVID. Um, fast forward a few years, we identified a few areas of the market that we can differentiate ourselves. And that's not getting easy. In this, in this world with almost 4,000 products. Interest rates were zero, and we came out with what I thought was a fairly innovative solution, and that's the first and only low duration preferred ETF. There was 30, 40 billion dollars of ETFs tied to preferreds, but people, investors, didn't realize the exposure they had to duration risk in those allocations. So we launched PFLD, and it quickly raised 200 million dollars in assets with essentially a $2 million seed and no backing. So there is opportunity out there. It's just challenging to identify and leverage your expertise um, to be successful. So I appreciate that. Mike, you serve as a trustee of a series trust with a number of new ETF issuers in it. 
from a, from a board perspective, not to make this a governance panel or anything like that, don't worry, um, but what, what do you look at and what conversations do you have with advisors looking to get into the ETF game? What questions do you have for them about whether they've really thought through the types of products that they want to bring to market? Yeah, sure. So, you know, we, we kind of take a, a step back at, at Sound, and one of the taglines we've attached to our company is, we're going to help you find the right label. Because as, as Michael mentioned, before you even step into the space, there's implications on the trust itself, uh, there's implications on the role of advisor, and then there's implications on uh, what service providers are attached to that trust. So you need to understand all your options, you need to be educated, on all of those things, and then per your question, Michael, you're, you're gonna be approaching a board. So give you a two second analogy, um, the iShares Trust, and the iShares Trust has BlackRock Fund Advisors as the advisor. Strangely enough, it's, it's incumbent upon the trustees of the BlackRock, or excuse me, of the iShares Trust to fire that advisor if they're not fulfilling their duty. So per your question, we're asking our clients, are there things that you feel that you can do, and of course you have to prove this not only to us, but in, to a board that you go in front of, can you do these advisor roles? Do you have the, the bench strength, the talent, and the depth? Do you have the finances to perform this role? Not only that, you can go into the area of portfolio management as well as sales and distribution. So we take a forensic look at all that and we help clients either decide one of two things. I'm ready, find me a trust, help me go in front of that board to prove my case, or the second part of that is, if you don't feel you're ready, then we're gonna help you find the right solution with the right partners in the industry, whether that's us um, or someone else. But there are cases, as you well know, Michael, where even after I talk to clients, um, I might look at them and say, you don't need anything. Go right to Michael and team and, and you're ready to go. They'll find a trust for you. So I'll finish by saying we feel it's important that everyone educates themselves on every single viable option for entering the space. When you go house hunting, you just don't stop at the first house and, and buy that one because you're in love with it. You're, you're gonna go out and look at a few more just to make sure you have everything um, checked, all the boxes. So that's, that's what we encourage people to do. So we should have planned better in advance because I recently bought a house and it was the first one that we had looked at. <laughs> I'll give you a pass on that one. Um, but let's, and you actually got uh, to see it, so that's. We, we did get to see it, yes. We did not buy it over the internet, sight unseen. I have no understanding of how people get but comfortable doing that. But was that your decision or your wife's? So. It was it, this one. I fell in love with the house. It's Sorry. So. Um, yeah. Aren't we supposed to be talking about ETFs? Okay, let's get back to the show here. Um, but I, I want to pivot to talking about structural decisions that you make when you're going to get into the ETF marketplace and you're a new advisor or you're a mutual fund advisor getting into the space, some of the decisions that you make. Uh, in Ben's keynote, he made reference to the fact that 6C11, the, the ETF rule, has killed the reason to have a trust or to have your own exemptive relief, uh, kind of took away all of the advantage there. So one of the things that this panel happens to have in common, because this is a very scientifically selected sample size of the universe here, uh, is they've all got products launching or launched in a series trust. So I wanna hear from you guys why you made that decision, as well as talking about some of the other decisions you made about who to work with, why to work with them, I've always found one of the real interesting parts of the ETF space is the number of different business models you can tap into to set up your product. There are components of the work you can outsource, there are consultants you can work with, there are series trusts or white label advisors, you've got all these different decisions to make, and none of them are necessarily right or wrong, but I, I wanna hear your stories about how you decided what the right fit of people were for what you were trying to accomplish. Um, Lance, I'm going to start with you on this one, in part because you had an existing product base outside of the ETF universe when AAM started getting into the space. Yeah, even before we get into that, I, d I don't think people, a lot of people maybe um, in this room understand the importance of the exemptive relief 10 to 15 years ago. I mean, that, that was a big thing, and there were, uh, every exemptive relief was quite different. I remember it was not uncommon for ETF issuers or people getting into the ETF space to go after and, and, and poach failing ETF issuers, like, like literally hand over and pay their cable bills and their phone bills for the exemptive relief as they were going out of business because it gave you such an advantage over the existing 
um, exemptive reliefs that were being issued, and that's no longer the case. That's no longer the case. Um, so with the ETF rule in place now, um, it definitely does free up issuers to come to market, but from a servicing standpoint, when I was coming to market six or seven years ago, um, it, it just made so much sense to go through a multiple series trust with US Bank. First and foremost, you can save a lot of expenses um, because the, the assets, or the, not the assets, but the costs um, and expenses are pooled through the trust, which is for a new ETF issuer getting into the space, which is going to encounter a lot of expenses, technology, data, sales, personnel, overhead. Um, though it, it's pricey, it's really expensive. And if you can save on costs operating through a multiple series trust, it makes a lot of sense. Um, also, the headache of putting together your own trust, um, which I had in the past, and managing the trust instead of sort of outsourcing it to a multiple series trust is, is quite um, appealing to those investors or issuers that are getting into the ETF space. Um, and then finally, I think for those getting into the ETF space, it's, it's great having sort of a talent pool and expertise of a Michael or Michael. Um, on your end, whether it's in the trust or on the legal side or on compliance, to, to ask, right? Because a lot of these ETF issuers don't have the ETF knowledge that they need to enter the space. And to have the resources like these two folks on the sides of me, it's really, really valuable. So from that standpoint, it was a no-brainer for me um, when we were launching our ETFs at Advisors Asset Management to explore the multiple series trust from U.S. Bank. Sylvia, how does Defiance think about who to partner with and um, other resources to tap in, in operating their ETFs? Yeah, so I think I would echo a lot of what Lance said, and I think that the size of your firm and the budget that you have also make a difference, right? If you have billions of dollars to invest into building an ETF business and you're part of a large existing institution, sometimes you have the internal sales team, sometimes you have the internal legal team, sometimes you have all of these things. But if you are, you know, kind of a, a newer issuer, to Lance's point, I mean, they, it's a no-brainer, right? You, you, you sort of can't build it um, from scratch most of the time. So, um, yeah, for us, we've all been in the ETF space, um, myself and, and the co-founder of, of my firm, for a long time, as long as, you know, as well as Lance. Um, so we have a lot of experience, I think, in terms of relationships. You know, I knew a lot of the lead market makers who we work with now. I knew a lot of the, um, you know, different partners, whether it was the banks for derivatives needs or, um, you know, the compliance groups or the distributor groups and, and things like that. So I would say that, you know, relationships go such a long way in this business. It's sort of an obvious thing to say, but um, I, I think we had a really great awareness of who does what and who's good at what and who would be a good fit for, we would be a good fit for. And then a lot of it is just making the calls, right? It, when it comes to bringing an ETF to market, you know, one market maker may favor taking a fund over another and wanting to seed a fund over another. Um, so it's kind of making those, those calls and seeing you know, what their priorities are, what their expertise is. You know, we recently launched these um, enhanced income funds and we found that certain market makers were, were you know, very well kind of qualified and, and skilled with those products, whereas some others would prefer our international equity exposure. Um, you know, in terms of the, the trust and the partnerships there, a lot of the partnerships do come from U.S. Bank. We get a lot of our compliance expertise from U.S. Bank. You know, we have our own internal compliance, but they certainly support us to make the right decisions. Um, same thing with Michael Legal. I mean, I think we've been talking to you a whole lot lately on some of the stuff we want to do. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just, um, you know, it, it's it's the result of making these longstanding relationships in the business, knowing what your products, what your product is, what the goals for your product are, and finding, you know similar types of, um, you know, beliefs and support systems in those products. There are days when I think Defiance was the catalyst for the SEC <laughs> amending the names rule, yeah. uh, given the number of thematic products. We've had battles about names and, and such. Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're probably, if I had to guess, <laughs> like be, the, the champions of BXTs. <laughs> we like to name funds certain things, and um, the regulators don't always like the names of those things. <laughs> so then we change them, but yes. <laughs> so Mike, from Sound Capital's view, um, you know, with the clients you're working with, where do you see the greatest need for support for new advisors coming into the ETF space? 
Sure, so I, I think along that avenue, um, the, the approach for us is binary. Um, either we're gonna be the expert for you and perform the role of white label advisor and then help you determine, can you trade in house or, or do you need a third party portfolio manager? Um, and on the other side of that equation, if we look at someone and they're right up next to that line and they need help, then we're gonna make you the expert over the course of putting your fund together with all the regulatory filings, choosing a trust all the way through launch and then beyond. It's simply not just about launching the fund um, and then going after assets. You really, really need a, a solid plan at the end of that rainbow to keep those assets, to maintain them. So there's a lot of product support and a lot of knowledge that also goes into it in the long term. So with clients in both categories, to, you know, to answer your question, um, I think obviously the, the most important part of the equation is starts with the advisor, simply because at the trust level, we mentioned that iShares Trust, right? I think it was started in 1999 or something like that. And you can look at the language in it, and it talks about each individual ETF in the iShares Trust. It's a series of the trust. So that's even technically a multi-series ETF trust because it has multiple series in it. The shared trust structure, which U.S. Bank and other service providers have, as Lance was mentioning, you know, that's the next step. Do, do you want to take on the responsibility of starting your own trust, or do you go to a shared trust where multiple advisors are already sharing the infrastructure and the service providers? Again, um, in my personal opinion, there's no one advantage of one trust over another because you're putting this in the hands of the trustees to make sure you don't fall down on the job. And again, even if you started your own trust and you did fall down on the job, it's incumbent upon them to replace you. So you're not getting much of an advantage in that term of uh, control. But to go back to your question, Michael, th these are the things that we really want everyone to understand in the beginning when they say, oh, I never knew that. Uh, re reporting's gonna be expected of me. And if the main person in this organization, um, key person risk, you know, how do we plan for that? It can't just be one person in a garage. However, ETFs are incredibly flexible because you can have a success story. For example, if you're an RAA that has a $100 million or $150 million ETF and you're weaving that into your practice, you never go over 150 million, but that's a, that is a success story. So ETFs can be a bespoke product within your organization, but to your key, Michael, you're stepping into the 40 Act world, so you first have to understand how are we gonna run this? Who are gonna be the people that do this? So one of the points you brought up was about portfolio management, and in Ben's keynote, he was talking about the importance of the capital markets role. So one of the themes that I hear quite frequently from new advisors coming into the ETF space is, gee, I don't understand this basket stuff. Uh, I know how to trade my portfolio, but I don't know who these lead market makers are. I don't know who these APs are. I have no experience with that part of, of trading or managing an ETF. And then they come to the question of, gee, should I even be responsible for that out of the gate, or should I be tapping a partner to do it, like a trading sub-advisor who may have experience or greater scale working in that space? Um, Sylvia, can you kind of comment on Defiance's experience working with a sub-advisor? Sure. So I, I would say that one of the best decisions that we ever made was working with our sub-advisors. So we actually have three sub-advisors. We have Pensero, we have Viden, I don't know if any of these guys are in the room, and Zega. But um, what, there's a, a few benefits. You know, first of all, you have access to these dead here. I don't know if... Okay. okay. <laughs> um, you have access to these trading firms that have experts in all sorts of different products. So, you know, one of our firms is, is again, I mentioned before, kind of the experts on equity. Um, we recently started working with another firm that is, is helping us, you know, get to market a very complicated fixed income emerging market type of product. Another firm is, you know, has expertise on trading um, zero data expiry options. But what I found there is that it goes back to, you know, I think what Mike mentioned before, uh, it, it's a bench of people with expertise that you don't have yourself. So um, our trading relationships essentially, they, you know, they manage the daily trading, which is great. We oversee it, so we're in constant communication. There's a whole lot of stress off of, you know, my plate <laughs> if I'm just sort of, you know, partnering with an expert in that particular um, product or you know, group of funds. Um, the other thing is that they do help you with the, the capital markets process. They help you with 
seed. Um, a lot of times we go out and get our own seed and our own lead market makers. And you know, sometimes if we have trouble on something, I can tell you one interesting thing. You know, when I was at my former employer, it was incredibly easy to get seed for anything. When you're a $30 billion firm, you have swap relationships, you have relationships with every client on the street, and you know, essentially people are making revenues off of you, they will seed everything for you. When you're a small new guy, it is so hard to get seed and you need to get to the market with seed. So I would say that um, one of the great benefits of those relationships have been people backing us up and supporting us and believing in our products and helping us get to market. Um, the the you know subadvisory trading relationships are just in, invaluable. Um, they've helped us write our derivatives rule along with U.S. Bank. They're they're just a great resource, particularly for small to mid-sized firms that don't have it in house. Lance, I would say Sylvia hit every single one of the major topics. What I, I what I would say is um, you know from a subadvisor standpoint, when we were getting into the ETF business. Um, you know, we weren't coming to market with derivative-based products. We weren't coming to market with really esoteric, you know, very illiquid solutions. We were coming to market with large cap equity, domestic equity, international equity, preferreds, pretty much fully replicating our underlying passive strategies. And my, my background initially in the ETF industry is really around portfolio management. Um, and, and that is my background, and even so, it would have been very simple to manage these baskets and manage these portfolios in-house. Um, but the reason why we, we outsource to our sub-advisor, which has been a fantastic decision, is really from an ETF issuer standpoint, it's around risk management, right? Um, if you're managing a basket, if you're managing trading, stuff is going to happen. Knock on wood, hopefully it never does, and on my watch it rarely ever happened. But what if, for one instance, you, you know, a, a rebalanced trade there's an error, the market goes against you, um, and there's a fifty, seventy-five thousand dollar trading error in a fund that's sitting in two and a half million dollars of, uh, of seed capital. That is a massive risk for new ETF issuers. And one of the reasons why we decided to go with a sub-advisor, Biden, I know they're in the back, is because this is their expertise, this is what they're doing, and, and quite honestly, um, they're there for the fund. So it, to, to Sylvia's point, certainly makes us sleep much easier at night knowing that this is sort of out of our hands and that we can fall back on the expertise of a sub-advisor. Um, so th again, that was another layup for us from a new ETF issuer standpoint. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add to that too, and you know, you mentioned Vida, we, when we sometimes think about products that are complicated and you know, we want to sort of try to figure out whether or not we can actually trade them and manage them and manage the liquidity, you know, some of these groups will work with us for months on something, whether or not we decide to launch it. And, and that's something that's just been awesome about those types of relationships. You know, you, you kind of hope to get them products that are, are a win, and then it's a win for everyone. But, but I have to say, you know, you would assume that if you have trading in-house, you can work on it tirelessly. It sort of doesn't matter what the outcome is. You hope it's good, you hope it's not, but you're, you're all working for the same firm. It's expected. And, and I, what I find surprising and great is, is, you know, they'll spend hours and share their expertise with you no matter which way that particular product goes, which, which is um, a really awesome uh, consulting aspect of, of what they do. So uh, I, you, I'll take you back to the, to the question, Michael, maybe kind of talk about this category. You talked about baskets. So great information here about sub-advisors, trading sub-advisors and how they help. So thank you for sharing that. And one thing I'll throw out there, we talked about 6E11, we talked about tax mitigation. And as you learn more about the things that are available to you as a portfolio manager managing the ETF, this topic of custom baskets comes up or custom tax mitigation. I think it's really important, and you've already touched on some of the, the topics on this, but um, the rules under 6011 for custom tax mitigation, they're available, but being accessible, that's another story. And what I mean by that is you are gonna need a capital markets partner to help you with this. There are many things in the ETF space that are available to you and you can enact at any time you want. But again, going out into the marketplace, into the capital markets world and trying to find somebody to say, hey, um, will you help me with this tax mitigation trade? And they look at you and they say, I don't know you, I don't make any money off of you. Um, there's, there's a continuum there. Um, even when we talk about skill with sub-advisors, sub-advisors do have that relationship, 
But again, going back to exploring all your options, I would highly encourage people to talk to the people out in the audience today who are capital markets professionals, who do lead market making. Talk to them about um, how they see it through their lens. Uh, we all have our opinion here as uh, folks that are experts in the industry, but I'm always one for letting them speak for themselves because you could be pleasantly surprised that you can have a relationship with them um, and you can have a conduit that makes these types of custom tax mitigations accessible to you, not just available to you. So we're, we're going to move on here to talk about sales and distribution. Um, but a heads up to the audience, we will save some time for questions uh, if anybody has anything they want to throw at our esteemed panel here. So uh, distribution and marketing, um, this tends to be one of the areas that I think is most challenging and painful for new ETF uh, entrants because they don't know where to spend their money, they don't know where to focus their time, uh, and they don't know where they're going to be able to raise assets from. Uh, Lance, I'm going to start with you because you're, you, your firm came into the ETF space with a variety of other product types, an existing sales team. Um, talk a little bit about your experience and what you learned along the way about marketing ETFs. Yeah, we, we definitely came to the market with a, a different sort of mindset and a different uh, skill set than, than most. Um, you know, first and foremost, AAM is really a distribution company. That's, that's what we are. Um, we have a number of of wholesalers on the on the ground, we have 30 different territories. We have a we have a hybrid role of about 15 individuals. We have a whole another fixed income team that worries about fixed income brokerage dealer. We have we we essentially you know, ironically, we came into this thinking that we were a distribution company and therefore we should be able to distribute ETFs. Um, and I, I think for those of you who have been around ETF distribution, and this is something that I've been heavily involved in over the last five years is that you know that there is a difference between a distribution of a mutual fund, an SMA, or a unit investment trust, and that of an ETF. And that, and that in fact, has been one of my biggest challenges is, is identifying the differences and not, um, you know, I, I know Ben mentioned, leverage what you can. And if you think about a distribution team, oh, let's, let's leverage the mutual fund distribution team. I don't want to surprise anybody here, but that didn't work at my first shop, it didn't work at my second shop, and it wasn't working at my third shop. It just doesn't work for a number of reasons. The sales cycle, the consultation nature, the, the, there's a, it's a different animal, let alone trying to convince uh, folks that uh, you know, tracking of ETF assets isn't as simple as seeing the run the next day. Um, that's that's mind-blowing. Um, so it's been a real challenge for us to sort of migrate our traditional mutual fund and SMA wholesalers into that of an ETFs. And, um, you know, seven years later, we went out and hired a dedicated ETF team. Shocker. Um, so that is our biggest challenge is, is distribution. And I cannot overstate the importance of that. And, and it's not just, it's just not sales, right? Because distribution has to be connected with the product team. It has to be connected with the marketing team. It has to be connected with the market participants, the liquidity providers, the APs. Um, it's, it's, it's getting much more involved than just having boots on the ground selling solutions. Throw on top of that what we've experienced with COVID. Our, our largest clients are the wirehouse community. These folks aren't in the office anymore. How are you reaching them? How are they consuming data? How are they consuming information? From that standpoint, what does your website look like? How are you driving people to your website? Are you doing webinars? Are you, are you doing podcasts? Are you do, like, there is so much more to distribution specifically we, with ETFs that you know, traditional asset managers haven't really had to deal with in the past. And I think those that are succeeding in distribution are essentially hitting on all cylinders for every one of those topics. So, Sylvia, you, Defiance came to the market with a very different set of resources than Lance's firm. Um, when Defiance launched 5G or the products more recently, you didn't have a giant sales team that sold mutual funds or an ETF sales team. What's worked for Defiance in being able to raise assets? Um, or a budget to even fly to a conference <laughs> or buy a conference ticket. So we have, we really had nothing. Um, during, there's a couple thoughts I have on this. Lance made a lot of really great points. And um, one thing that I've learned over the years is, you know, having huge sales teams um, that are focused on things like, 
you know, metrics, um, things like, we made so many phone calls this year, so, you know, more phone calls than last year. We had so many meetings this year. We did, you know, all of these things on paper, but, but assets didn't go anywhere, and so it must be the market's fault. You know, I, I think that world has changed now. So the salesperson, I think now, in order to be successful, has to be A, hungry, but B, also a capital markets person, also a product specialist, and, and also somebody who likes getting out with people and actually trying to sell things. So I think the, that, you know, old school model, it's, 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 it's tough, you know, unless you've been around for a long time and your products are just up on platforms and, and you're sort of lucky, but if you're new, it has to be a hustle. Um, so we went about it a different way. We knew that we didn't have the balance sheet or the funds to, you know, hire a group of salespeople. Uh, myself, the chairman of our firm, Matt Belsky, and I were trying to talk to everybody we could under the sun, and then we realized that, you know, that's not going to work. <laughs> Um, and we, again, during COVID, saw that, you know, we don't have staff, we don't have time, we don't have the resources to, to get our product out there. So two things. One is um, we had an internal person who did our marketing, and he sort of figured out a few things. He figured out how to, you know, spend money on ads and get positions in Google. That seems like an obvious thing, but he figured out how to backdoor certain things. He worked with Google, Google representatives to see how you get more you know, bang for your buck. He figured out how to get more impressions on things. He figured out how to create a more stealth marketing campaign. And because we were starting from scratch in a way, it was easier. We didn't have these you know, clunky Salesforce types of systems that were full of bad data from the last 10 years of people making stuff up. You know, we had just data of, of people. So we started running email campaigns and digital ads and, and really like um, connecting it all with AI and, and getting to a point where we could see if an RIA, you know, sort of came to our website or, or opened an article about a certain topic that was really related to a fund. Um, so long story short, we did this and, and we quickly started raising um, money and some of our ETFs through this digital marketing and sales effort. And then a couple of other ETF providers were, were almost teasing us about it, like, how, do, how can you guys possibly be growing? You don't have any people, you know, I, we see you all over the place, the ads are, you know, the ads are everywhere, your tickers are popping up. And then we started picking up, you know, a, a few ETF companies gave us a shot to do the same thing for them. And, you know, where we are today is we have Defiance ETFs, but under our umbrella, we also have Defiance Analytics, which is a digital marketing company. And we represent, you know, 30 different asset managers and ETF providers in their own marketing and advertising. Um, and yeah, I mean, so we go about it differently. It's all digital, you know, AI, trying to get quality data. Um, you know, the downside is we don't have anybody going to buy crab cakes in a wirehouse and, you know, get, getting any of those trades. But we have a really strong presence with, like, social media, with the retail community, with RAs and family offices. So that's how we do it. I think that's an interesting story that, that I've heard more than once about firms that started to be an ETF issuer and along the way discovered they had a particular core competency that was of value to other players. So whether it's analytics or marketing or sub-advisory, uh, like uh, being a trading sub-advisor, uh, any of those kinds of skills, sometimes you discover you have another business opportunity beyond just having your own funds uh, so anytime you're doing something well, there, there may be another opportunity there. Yeah, and by the way, that saved us, right? I mean, the revenue that we generated from becoming, you know, having this marketing company, we kind of spun it off so it's its own LLC. There's no, you know, the first thing people would say is like, wait a minute, aren't we going to be competing with you? You're an ETF company too. It's its own thing now. But, you know, during that time, it helped us stay alive because we launched our biggest ETF, you know, grew to close to a billion dollars. But... It had, you know, a 30 bips fee, and it's just just not a lot, right? So it's it's good to have different um, different ideas out there too. Yeah, the downside of competitive fees, right? right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, indeed. All right. Uh, if there are questions, we have a few minutes, and you can save us from the song and dance routine that <laughs> we've otherwise uh, prepared. Sure. Are they out on their own, or are they working in concert with your other, call it traditional, um, you know, sales folks in the marketplace? Yeah. So the, the, these these folks do live in the in the regions in the territories. Um, it is in their best interest to operate alongside 
their existing wholesalers who are, you know, distributing the mutual funds, the units, and every other product that we offer at AAM. Um, so with an average 10 year, I think the average 10 year of our, our traditional wholesalers is about eight or nine years. So there's a lot of relationships that have been built up, right? And these ETF issuers have been uh, other ETF issuers. They're bringing the ETF knowledge. They're, they're bringing the ability to talk about liquidity and, you know, bid-ask spreads and, you know, implied liquidity and this and all that and, and the nature of distributing the ETFs and they're working with the existing wholesalers. Now that raises a lot of issues, right? Think about, uh, think about commissions. Think about, you know, whose relationship these are. It, it, it opens up a whole can of worms that most people don't think about. Um, but that is one of the nuances. But yes, to, to answer your question, they are working in tandem with the traditional wholesalers. Other questions? Okay, I have one. I want to know from each of you what the one thing you learned along the way that's been most important to you that you really wish you knew up front. Let's start with you, Mike. Just, just, just one thing. Not just a, one thing. Not We're not going to be here all day. Okay, so I, I think that, um, not to be cliche or anything, but I would say the one, the one thing that I've learned and I've tried my best, um, despite my failings, um, check your ego at the door. Because this, this industry continues to evolve, whether that's from a uh, SEC standpoint or whether that's from a nuance that comes out of the capital markets world, or whether that's a humbling experience like trying to become an advisor yourself. Um, I think one of the things that's key to this industry, we talk about dynamic change, we talk about all of those types of things, but there's so many moving parts, okay? Um, you, you can try to have a, a knowledge of, of certain things and be an expert in those, but you know, as they say in Chicago, we got a guy for that. Don't be afraid to have a person to go to for it and, and not, in, and be humble enough just to say, you know what, I don't know. I, I got to check with Lance, or I got to check with Sylvia, or I got to check with Michael. Um, so that would be the key thing that I think over the years, starting all the way back as a trader in the industry and coming full circle to now helping people run their own businesses. I, I would say, again, as a, per, as a person that started off as portfolio management and product development and product management, um, I can't overstate the importance of distribution, right? A lot of conversations start with product. Asset manager has a product. We've been successful in this product. It's different. Um, but if you can't answer the distribution question, um, chances are, or you're not willing to answer that or put in the resources to answer that, um, it's going to be very, very challenging. As Ben mentioned, that first $100 million is probably one of the hardest things you can do in the ETF industry. So. Um, again, distribution is extremely important. There are obviously many different ways that you can go about being, this, being successful in the distribution area, but you have to be committed because that, at the end of the day, is probably the most important thing. Sylvia? Um, I, I think there are two, so I'll, I'll steal this from the opening remarks. You should know where your first $100 million is coming from before you launch a product. We have definitely launched products that we thought were the most stellar ideas, um, and a tree fell in the woods. No one cared, and we had to close them. So you actually know where your $100 million is coming from. And the other thing is... Um, you know, know, know when to fold and, and to admit that you're wrong and something isn't working. As a startup, we've experienced this a lot, but we've had, you know, procedures in place and structures in place for distribution, and we've tried them and, you know, ha had seen no results and then would kind of just, you know, tweak it a little bit and, and continue with it and realize that we're not getting results. And, and sometimes you have to say, a sa you know, traditional sales just doesn't work for us. We should be a digital company and, and you know, even if you've spent a lot of time and money on something that just isn't working, you know, as Mike said, leave your, leave your ego at the door and, you know, figure out a better way to do it before it's too late. Sylvia, Lance, Mike, thank you all very much for, for sharing your thoughts today. Uh, please join me in thanking them for, for their time. <laughs> <laughs>